Good evening, officially, and welcome to the Principles of Grammar. I'm going to define grammar for you in a minute, but now I want to stress the word principles at the outset. Our concern in this course is with the basic ideas of grammar, the broadest concepts, the most important fundamental ideas of the subject. We're not going to review copybook details or trivia or endless lists of memorized concretes. In other words, there are many points of grammar that I will not be covering, which I think you can look up as necessary. I want to give you in these evenings something that I think is much harder to get from the books, and that is a clear understanding of the essential framework and foundation of grammar and of the essence of grammatical issues. If, if you have that, then uh, details can easily be looked up in a book and you'll have the context to understand them. Where relevant, I'm going to give you, where relevant and where I can, I'm going to give you also the philosophic basis of grammatical principles. And by philosophic, I mean, of course, according to the philosophy of objectivism. I'd like you to be able to see not only the principles of grammar, but why those principles uh, are as they are, what the roots of those principles are in the nature of the human mind and of human knowledge. Ideally, you should be able at the end to see every grammatical rule, directly or indirectly, as a consequence or expression of some essential requirement of the human mind. In other words, I do not want you to see it or to retain it as simply a hodgepodge of memorized rules which make no sense. Now, there are different things that you can stress in a grammar course. I should tell you at the outset that I am here concerned primarily with grammar for writers, grammar for purposes of writing. I'm focusing on those issues that I myself found helpful in the process of writing. Many times I've had this experience, and those of you who write, I'm sure, must have in one way or another. You write a sentence in your original rough draft, you feel dissatisfied, it doesn't say what you want, or at least it doesn't say it as effectively somehow as you expected, and you want to know why. Well, sometimes, of course, the reason is your thinking is simply unclear. You don't know what you want to say. But often I have found that my mode of expression was at fault. My thought was basically clear, but my sentences unknown to me violated some rule or principle of grammar or some distinction which when I discovered suddenly unlocked the dissatisfaction and I could see, oh yes, now I see right away what's wrong with this and here's how to say it so it really satisfies me and is really clear. Uh, if you want to know what type of issues that we'll be coming to that this worked on, for instance, the distinction between subordinate and main clauses, and very often, uh, we'll get to that next time, the emphasis of your sentence is off, you don't know why, and as soon as you know this distinction, you see, oh, I've got my main thought in a subordinate clause and there's nothing to redoing it. Or your sentence is too wordy, but you offhand can't see how to cut out words and there are grammatical techniques of economy. Or your verb seems inexact, your tense is somehow wrong, but you don't know what options there are, what other tenses might there be. Or there's something funny about your punctuation, but you're not sure, etc., etc. If you know some essential concepts of grammar, I found that it is very helpful in letting you know right away on direct inspection when you look at your sentence, ah, now I know what's wrong with this, what my options are, what to do to straighten it up. Now at the end of the course, if it's successful, I hope that you will have a sense of logic and security. Logic in regard to understanding the nature of grammatical issues, why they are as they are, and therefore security in regard to the whole subject. You know their purpose, the rationale of the rules, and so I hope you will be able to think at the end, you can now make decisions on your own in dubious or controversial cases. You don't have to rely helplessly on authorities. In other words, I want as much as possible to make you feel grammar is your personal field of expertise, not the product of some alien they who have inexplicable rules that you have to look up 
and try uh, to follow. Now one requirement of course is that I have to be clear to, to achieve these, but another comes from you. You must do the homework, you must do the exercises. Uh, they are simply essential, particularly for the first few lectures, because we'll be introducing you to the base of all the rest and a vast torrent of terminology which simply has to be automatized, like learning a foreign language. And this can be done only by repetition. So, uh, I put a plug in. If you simply come but don't do the homework, you will find it very difficult to follow from session to session. You will not retain it. And all you'll really get are the jokes. Uh, I estimate that you should allot approximately two hours a week outside of class for the homework that I will be assigning, if you're doing it uh, conscientiously and to get the most out of it. Now this evening we are devoting ourselves entirely to the basic concepts and distinctions that are essential to the whole subject of grammar. And that means a vast host of terminology. Most of these terms I'm sure you will know and have heard of, but they do need review and you have to know their exact definition and usage. So if you're taking notes, I would just make my notes tonight a vast list of terms with the definitions. And let's plunge right in with the definition of grammar itself. Language has two elements or two aspects. Words, the individual words, and the way those words are put together to communicate thoughts. Individual words and the relationships of the words to make thoughts. Grammar is studies the latter. It studies putting the ways of putting words together to make sentences. How to put words together to form meaningful sentences is the essence of the definition of grammar. Now, I can give you a formal definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, which I will simply rattle off and not take time for you to copy down, but you'll see it's the same thing. The science that deals with the means of indicating the relations of words in the sentence and with the rules for employing these in accordance with established usage. That amounts to how to put words together to form meaningful sentences. So grammar in that regard is both a science and an art. A science in that the subject describes the principles by which the language is constructed. An art in that when you know those principles you learn how to form sentences properly yourself. Now traditionally uh, grammar is divided into a number of branches. I will simply mention two branches, although this is not important. And I'd like to, let's make a pact when I say something is not important, you don't take notes on it and then I don't have to go slowly. This is just for cocktail party background, so to speak. There is a branch called accidents, like accident, but it ends in C-E, which studies inflections, the inflections of language. Now, that's one branch of grammar. Uh, what is an inflection? That's the word I would like you to know, as the term is used in grammar. Uh, does anybody know? Does anybody want to volunteer? What an infl I know it's pretty hard to come up with a whole thing in front of all these people, but uh, you know something about an inflection is a, is a change in part of a word, right? A change in a bit of a word, right, in order to communicate some difference in the usage of the word. Uh, so, for instance, boy and boys are the same word, only you change the ending. You put an S on, and by that means you indicate plural. That's called an inflection, the S. Or play and played. Play is I play the present, I played the past. You put ED on, that is an inflection. It's a little change in the form of the word. In this case, it indicates a past tense, etc. Now, uh, many, many words are inflected in English. And let us therefore give you this definition of inflection if you want to take it down. A change in the form of a word in order to express a change of meaning or role in the sentence. Change in the form of a word in order to express a change in the use or meaning or role of the word. I and me is the same word as far as grammar is concerned, but they are considered inflected versions of each other. I is when you do something, me is when it's done to you. 
So the same word, but one as subject, one as object. Well, one way, obviously, of indicating the relations of words in a sentence is by inflection. And therefore, one subject that will be coming up over and over is the types of inflections that are used to establish what types of relationships. What other main way is there of establishing the relations between words besides tinkering with their endings? Well, the actual order or arrangement of the words. Which word comes first, and then second, and then third in the sentence? If I say, Jack hit Tom, that has an entirely different meaning from Tom hit Jack. The words are identical. There's no, inflected, no changes in inflection, but the order obviously changes the meaning completely. What is the branch of grammar that studies order of language, the order of words? Syntax, Syntax correct, S-Y-N-T-A-X. That's simply the branch of grammar which studies the arrangement of words in a sentence, the order. Basically, all of our grammar is going to be in studying inflections and syntax. And we're even going to consider grammar more broadly than this. We're going to throw in pretty much the kitchen sink. The only thing we're going to exclude, uh, there's a long historical tradition justifying this. The only thing we're going to exclude from our study of grammar is errors that specifically pertain to one word, that is not words in relation to each other. For instance, if you mispronounce or misspell a word, we will not consider that a grammatical error. So there'll be no section in this course on spelling or pronunciation, etc. But leaving that aside, we're taking grammar in its most generous usage. Now uh, let me motivate you. George Orwell uh, said, famous line, grammar is not important as long as you make your meaning unmistakable. Now, if that's true, obviously a course such as this is a waste. The whole subject is a waste. What do you think of that statement? Grammar is not necessary as long as you make your meaning unmistakable. If you had to answer that in a sentence as distinct from a volume, yes? Grammar is the means of making your meaning unmistakable. Right, that's exactly all it is. It's the means of making your meaning unmistakable. So, uh, for him to make uh, a statement of this kind is entirely to misconstrue the purpose of grammar. Now, what caused him and causes many people to have this idea? Their view of the source of grammatical rules. Let's therefore turn to the question of what is the actual source and status of the rules we're going to be studying. I'm going to be giving you rule after rule. We may as well find out their basic foundations at the outset. Now, first I'm going to give you a wrong view, in fact, two wrong views, and then by contrast, bring out the right basis for grammar. The dominant view uh, 50, 75, 100 years ago was in grammar what classicism was in art, if you know that, uh, like the type of architect that Rourke was fighting in the fountainhead. On this view, grammar is a set of absolute, concretely detailed rules or principles, which had been defined once and for all in ancient Rome were set down by Latin grammarians, and these were detailed rules giving the answer to every question. And grammar from this perspective was simply applying to English what the Latin authorities thousands of years ago had established. This is a very authoritarian view of grammar, and it came up with many arbitrary rules uh, which had a basis in Latin and none whatever in English, which is after all a different language. And it's rules of this kind that cling in people's mind when they think, oh, grammar is a whole bunch of artificial uh, uh, trivia. For instance, you mustn't end a sentence on a preposition. Now, this is a completely illegitimate rule of English grammar, although it's part of one of this nest of traditional rules that are uh, passed on. Grammarians, modern enlightened grammarians, uh, love to point out the number of cases in English where you must and should and can properly end sentences on prepositions. In fact, I read this one recently. A young boy asked his father uh, to bring up a book to read him a story from, and uh, it was the wrong book. 
and the little boy said to his father, why did you bring the why did you bring the book that I don't want to be read to out of up for? <laughs> now that is a perfectly clear English sentence and it ends on five prepositions. Now that would make any traditional grammarian, you know, just roll over in the grave. And that's the type of thing that Orwell would have in mind when he says, uh, uh, oh, who needs it as long as you make your meaning clear? Now if you add in to this general inadequacy of the traditional approach, the modern development of subjectivism philosophically, you can see that the pendulum was very quickly swing to the opposite extreme, and that led to the modern view, which is now what's uh, taught in the schools, the so-called permissive view. That is that there are no principles of grammar. Grammar is simply a description of prevailing usage, whatever it happens to be. There's no right or wrong, there's no good or bad, there's only this is what we do or what we don't do, and if enough people do it, that becomes grammar. Uh, and of course, this is a complete denial of grammar. You end up doing whatever you feel. And a very well-known American grammarian denying this conclusion uttered the immortal line, quote, them conclusions simply ain't got no justification. The being, every part of that sentence, you see, being completely sanctified by vast amount of usage, but uh, it's still wrong. Now, if you look at these two alternatives, what uh, two approaches to philosophy do they uh, involve applied now to grammar? One says, in effect, Glamour is, a, uh, glamour, excuse me. grammar is a matter of revelation, in effect, from the ancients. It's a mystic revealed set of absolutes and you just have to accept. And the other says, oh, it's all a uh, matter of arbitrary social opinion. Now, what philosophic dichotomy is that? That objectivism, of course, rejects in ethics and in politics and in every other field, therefore also in grammar. Now, I have to hear from someone, because here you only have to say two words. So that is not too, too uh, yes, Mr. Ross. Subjectivism is one versus, well, what do we usually call mysticism, though? Yes, the intrinsic view, the intrinsicist view versus the subjectivist view. The mystic re revelation type view as opposed to it's all a matter of opinion, no one can know anything. Now, of course, the objectivist alternative, and this is the very source of the word objectivism, to both the intrinsic and the subjective is, Marianne? I'm what? I'm what is the alternative to the intrinsic and the subjective? Oh, objective. The objective, right. And the correct view of grammar is that grammar is objective. And that's what I want to elaborate for you briefly at the outset. On the one hand, let us concede that Latin is only one language among others. And there is no reason why its grammatical principles have to rule every particular of every language. The principles of grammar would derive in part from language in general. They would apply to any language. And in part, they would have to derive from the distinctive nature of a particular language. There are obviously many options, many different possible ways of combining words into sentences. Latin is not the only model. Uh, Latin happens, and this is true of all the classic ancient languages, like Greek, for instance, or Russian. Latin happens to be a very heavily inflected language. You remember what we meant by inflected, that you indicate relationships by the ending of words. And you know, if you learn a single word in, English, in Latin, like call, C-A-L-L, -L, you know, like uh, call, hi, how are you? That kind of call. In English, how many forms of call are there? There's call, calls, called, calling. Maybe you can dredge up five if you're lucky. And with that, you can say everything, past, present, future, singular, plural, passive, active, everything you want, hundreds of t different ways, by word order only. But in Latin, you do it all in one word. Doesn't make any difference where you place it by changing the ending. And so you have to learn. Just page after page, and it's all vocal. 
and the little ending is switched, is inflected to indicate its function in the sentence. Now, a, a language such as English, and this is true of most of the modern languages, which does not make too much use of inflection, is called a distributive language. And that is essentially English is the most distributive language. I believe also Chinese. A distributive language establishes the relationships primarily by syntax, by word order, not by inflections. Now, there are some inflections in English, but not much. Now, of course, this is going to make a huge difference in your grammar, because many, many rules of order will be required in English that will have no counterpart in Latin, and vice versa. Many things will be dictated by an inflected language that will have no application to a language which is basically not inflected uh, like English. So in English, you have to say, Jack hit Joe. In Latin, you could take those three words and say, Jack, Joe hit, Jack hit Joe, Joe hit Jack, Joe, Jack hit. It doesn't make any difference. You can pull them out of a hat and get the same meaning, because the endings of each is inflected to tell you, you know, what it, you're supposed to do with it. Now, uh, this is one thing we must, uh, we must recognize. There are many different types of language, and there's particularly basic distinction between a distributive and an inflected language. English is a distributive language. It goes by word order. And therefore, that is going to very much reduce the similarity to Latin. There are many other options, I may say, that I haven't even hinted at, but I just like you to get the clear idea. Anything that human beings can do conceivably or even inconceivably to establish relations among words they have done somewhere and some uh, uh, linguist will regale you. For instance, there's one tribe somewhere or other that uses pitch as a grammatical device. So they use a low tone for the past and a high for the future, etc. Now there's no equivalent of that in English except we use pitch sometimes for questions. You're coming? You're coming. You see, uh, you use it sometimes to indicate a question. But there are languages where the whole grammar is in how high and low you speak. But we don't have to worry about that. I'm simply indicating there are many, many options. So the intrinsic view is wrong. But now let's go to the other one. It does not follow that therefore anything goes. That any combination is uh, OK and that it's all a matter of arbitrary fit. That does not follow. Subjectivism doesn't follow. Why? Because we're talking, after all, about words. And words designate concepts which have a nature and which have to be treated in a certain way. The human mind has a nature. Thought has a nature. And if you violate the requirements of the mind, of the conceptual level of thought, you are necessarily going to be unclear, ambiguous, confused, inexact. Now, the basic standard of right and wrong for grammar is, comes down to clarity in essence, which means reference to reality. Does, is this rule required by the nature of thought in order to make your uh, relationship of concepts clear, in order to make it exact, in order to designate something specific in reality? Our concern, our standard, what validates the rules is precision, logic, exactness of thought. And there are definite requirements for this. It's not a matter of opinion. Does that mean that a uh, uh, valid rule of grammar would apply to every language? Not necessarily. Certain essential distinctions, as we'll see, would have to be present in some form in every language by the very nature of concepts. But there may be many, many optional methods of living up to those abstract principles. And what you will find is that within a given language, there's an awful lot of conventions adopted within that specific language to adhere to the broad mandatory principle. Those conventions may be true only in this language and not in some other, although they'll have a counterpart in some other language, as you'll see when we get to uh, some actual examples. Uh, the rules for instance, of English, in many cases, are conventional and could have been different. But if they were different, you'd be speaking a different language. And in that different language, you'd need equivalent rules in order still to live up to the basic requirements of clear logical thinking. Do you follow that? So uh, if you keep this in mind, you'll see that the, 
that all of the rules ultimately are simply different ways of meeting essential mandatory requirements. And that is really the answer to the idea that grammar is arbitrary. Now let's give this some content. Let's turn to actual content of grammar now. The most essential concept of grammar is inherent in its very definition. Grammar, we said, is how to put words together to form a sentence. Well, the central concept is sentence. S-E-N-T-E-N-C-E, -E -E, sentence. This comes from sentire, which means to think or feel. And a sentence, a preliminary definition, would be a group of words expressing a complete thought or feeling. A group of words expressing a complete thought or feeling. That's a preliminary definition. Now, just to clarify a few minor and insignificant points, I'll keep on doing that when something I'm saying is not important. I'll tell you, so if you're tired, you can just tune out. And when you come back, uh, you won't have missed anything. But if you have the strength, it might clarify a little side thing, you see. <clears throat> Theoretically, you can't have a sentence with one word, like, stop. Uh, but we will not be concerned with that, so we're going to say a group of words. Also, you may ask, why say, uh, which expresses a complete thought, or feeling? And the reason feeling is stuck in is because they normally distinguish four types of sentences. The so-called declarative, which tells you that a certain fact is the case. The interrogative, which asks a question. The imperative, which gives an order. And then the exclamatory, which amounts to saying, whew, or aha, uh -huh, you know, some uh, incoherent, inarticulate expression of emotion. And it's to cover the exclamatory sentences that they put the word emotion in. But we're going to neglect all of these types except for the real hardcore declarative sentence, which is the essential. And that's why we're going to, for our purposes, come back to sentence as a word group expressing a complete thought. Now, what is a complete thought? Now, this is not just a linguistic. This is a, an intellectual or philosophical question. And if you grasp this, you're in good state as far as grammar is concerned. Is Atlas Shrugged a complete thought? Well, obviously, in a sense, it is. You could say the thought is man needs a new rational philosophy. And that's the whole book. Except, obviously, we're using complete thought in a different way uh, than that. There are many, many, many sub-thoughts that go to make up that one complete thought, which is the whole book. When we talk about a complete thought in terms of a sentence, we mean complete in the sense of a self-intelligible unit of thought. A self-intelligible unit of thought is what we mean by a complete thought. Now let me clarify this. A single concept is not yet a thought. It's simply the material, the tool of a thought. For instance, if I say door, I haven't given you a thought, I've just given you a word. It's, if I put it together with some other words and I do it the right way, I can come up with a thought, but that is not yet a thought. If I come in and just say the, or open, or is, those are all just the constituents of a thought. They're not yet a thought, they're the material. But if I walk in and say, the door is open, I have put words together in such a way as to give a complete thought. Now, this is not everything I think about that. Perhaps I have all kinds of exciting thoughts about the material of the door, and why it's open, and what I want to do, and so on. But nevertheless, I got out one actual finished entity intellectually. This is what we mean by a sentence, the smallest self-contained unit of a thought process. The smallest self-contained unit of a thought process. And of course, the key word there is self-contained, because if I just say is open, that's not a thought yet. It's not self-contained. It doesn't stand by itself. But if I say the door is open, then I've got a thought. Who knows what grammarians call a part of a sentence which is not a, an actual sentence, like, for instance, just is open. Do you know what that's called? When you fragment a sentence into parts, what do you think you call the fragment? Fragment. You call it a fragment. Right. Very good. 
So a complete thought is a sentence is contrasted to a fragment on the one hand. If I come in and say, holding firm, your question will be, what is holding firm? I say, the dikes are holding firm, that's a complete thought. All right. So one thing a sentence is contrasted with is a fragment. On the other side, a sentence is contrasted with more than one complete thought. In other words, we said it is the smallest self-contained unit. If I say the door is open, it is painted red, that is not one thought, that is two thoughts, two sentences. Now, if in grammar you put a whole bunch of these together without any punctuation, Imagine the following is all just small letters, no punctuation. The door is open, it is red, it is hard to miss, and go on and on. That's like the other side of the coin from a fragment. It's a whole bunch of them jammed together. More than one thought, who knows what that's called. When you run on one right into the next. You know what that is called? A run on. Very good. And those are the two contrasts to a sentence. Now, this is a, an intellectual, a conceptual, not just a a formal issue. A sentence must be really one thought. It must have an actual intellectual unity to it. Therefore, if you stick in an irrelevant or logically unconnected element, it is not a sentence. Not just that it's not a good sentence, it is literally not a sentence. Now here's an example. The modern grammars, by the way, don't subscribe to what I'm saying because they make it strictly a conventional issue. But I'm taking this from an older grammar, which I'm going to praise in one moment. And this, to me, was a very illuminating point. This is a, uh, an example this book gave as not a sentence. Now listen to this. Don't copy it down, it's not necessary, but just listen to it. At last, late in September, constant bombardments forced the surrender of Warsaw, where I spent my vacation six years ago. Now, any modern grammarian would say that's a sentence. And yet, actually, there is no inherent logic in that. Why? The whole thing is about the bombardments and so on, and suddenly you spent your vacation there. That thought, that part about the vacation is simply thrown in, juxtaposed, brutally, uh, next to a different subject matter. <coughs> There's no overall unity. Now, the modern grammars say it's a bad sentence. But the older grammars say it's not one thought. It is actually not a sentence. And uh, with that, I agree. And I find that a very helpful uh, statement. For instance, as a contrast, you could say, at last, late in September, constant bombardments, which were massive in scope, forced Warsaw, etc. Then it's all one thought. Or you could say, constant bombardments forced the surrender of Warsaw, which had become a mere shell. You see, you're continuing the same concept. But when you suddenly stick in, and by the way, my grandmother went on vacation there, it's completely out of the blue. The point is that a sentence has to be a single, one, completed unity. Now this example, by the way, if you want a bibliographical reference is from this truly excellent grammar, the only good one I ever found. This is the one that I was given as a student in college, as a freshman. Um, it's unfortunately long out of print, but if you ever can find a copy, I strongly recommend it. It's called Writing and Thinking by two authors, Norman Forster, F-O-E-R-S-T-E-R, F-O-E-R-S-T-E-R, and J.M. Stedman, S-T-E-A-D-M-A-N, Forster and Stedman. It was published by Houghton Mifflin, and the edition I have is 1941. Uh, I'm going to be using that book very frequently in this course. Uh, it was one of the, the best for making clear that the logic and the essential reasoning behind uh, grammatical rule. All right, let's see where we are then. Is there a second choice? Uh, there's a lot of grammar texts that you can use of a more modern kind, the Harbray series is okay. They'll list all the rules, but they just list them off, you know, mechanically, so to speak. They, they don't have a depth of intellectual understanding the way this one does. I don't know any other like this one. Probably if you get one from the 19th century, you'll, you'll have a better chance. But now to summarize. 
you can think of a thought uh, as expressed in a sentence like a soul in relation to a body. The soul is the thought. The body is the group of words expressing. So a sentence in that sense is like an organism. And the period, therefore, you know what I mean by a period, that little dot that goes at the end of the sentence, is an extremely significant mark in grammar because a period means end of a unit. It tells the reader and yourself, in effect, this is a key division. This is my first entry. If you want to judge, evaluate, comprehend, this is the first place I'm prepared for you to stop. This is the smallest place for you to stop and take it in. Now this will be very important, uh, uh, we'll find uh, throughout. And by the way, if you're writing, if you remember that a sentence is the expression of a thought, you can find this helpful in editing. Sometimes you'll find you write a sentence and it's not right. And you're trying to correct it one word at a time, sort of mechanically tinkering with the body, and you can't get it. The thing to do there is forget about the body and go back to the soul. Or tell yourself, what was the thought I wanted to communicate? Throw out this body and start again from the original wellspring in your mind. And you will very often find that the thought will come in new words. And you'll see that there was no use trying to salvage the wording you had on the paper, that you could do much better by going back to the start again. I want to stop you a minute, please. Yes. Perfect space, Woody. Now I want to analyze what's involved structurally in being a sentence. What makes a thought complete? What is the bare minimum required to get a complete thought using words? Well, obviously, two elements are required. There must be something you're talking about and something you say about it. That's it. Something that you single out, name, refer to, otherwise you're not talking about anything, so you can't get off the ground and something you're saying about the thing you singled up. What is the name of the first? The subject you're talking about. What would be a good name for the subject? subject. It's called the subject. Very good. What would be a good name for the characteristics you ascribe to the subject, the characteristics you predicate of it? Predicate. It's called a predicate. Right. So that's very simple. Subject, whatever you're talking about. Predicate whatever you say about it. Now, in the simple sentences, therefore, the whole sentence can be thought of as dividing into these two. We'll leave aside more complex cases, but for now. I'm going to give you a sentence, and you raise your hand if you know which part goes in the subject and which goes in the predicate. The dikes are holding. Uh, let me try somebody different. Yes. The dikes, the dikes, the dikes, right. And the predicate? Are holding. All right, now here's a more difficult case. We're escalating very rapidly here. The dikes on the east bank are holding firm. Lewis? The dikes on the east bank. Is the subject and the predicate? Are holding. are holding firm. All right, one more. Just to show you, you can make your subject, you can go on pages. The dikes on the East Bank, which were built in the middle of the past decade, are now on the verge of collapsing noisily and fatally. Okay, where did the subject end? Decade. decade, right. The whole thing, it's a long, long thing. You're talking about the dikes on the East Bank, which were built in the middle of the past decade. And what are you saying about them? That they're now on the verge of collapsing noisily and fatally, etc. Now, this all seems very obvious. Now, look at the page entitled uh, Lecture 1, or at least that pertains to Lecture 1. Uh, number one, these examples are to illustrate to you that you cannot determine subject and predicate by order. It is not true that the first word is always the subject. Many are the days I met him. Now think, what is the subject of that sentence? By the standard being, the subject is what you are talking about. Are you talking about many? Are you saying, many is a glorious word, I use it all the time. Obviously not. What are you talking about? Raise your hand when you can tell me the exact words that designate what you're talking about. Yes. The days, the days I met him is the subject. What is the predicate in this case? Are many. Are many. Okay. So that doesn't bother you. What about where is your mother? 
Now, this is not a subject about where. Now, this is interrogative, so don't let that throw you. This is perhaps the one interrogative sentence in the entire course. It means it has a question mark after. Uh, what is the subject of this um, sentence? Yes. Your mother. Your mother. And what is the predicate? Where is. Or is where. Yes, is where. Your mother is where. Uh, now, the next one. Now, be careful for this one. What is the subject? What are you talking about? And what are you saying about it? Now, you're going to be thrown off here, I know. But that's okay. That's why I put the example in. Uh, Miss Office, yes. Uh, three dogs. Very good. Three dogs is the subject. That's what you're talking about. What are you saying about them? Give me the full predicate now. Are there on the corner? Well, no, there is not part of it. Just are on the corner. Now, there, here's another word for you to take down, another technical term. There are certain words which are not part of the grammar of a sentence. They function simply to get the sentence off the ground, to get started. But they don't, they're not part of the structure of the sentence. Usually, it or there. And in this case, there. And do you know the name of this? They're called expletives, believe it or not. This has nothing to do with expletives deleted, you know, from the Nixon tapes. Uh, uh, expletive, E-X-P-L-E-T-I-V-E, -E, is, is an empty word like it or there, which is used simply to get the sentence started, which is not part of the subject or predicate, not part of the grammar. All right, now if you've got this, this is our, yes, Kathy. Uh, uh, it is not enough to do your homework, you must do it careful. The actual structure is to do your homework is not enough. The it is simply like a filler. It says, it is not enough. Now I'm going to tell you what I mean by it. And then it pushes the it out, you see. So it's just an introductory word like there. It's an expletive. Sometimes, of course, it is a regular pronoun. You know, uh, it bit me. And that it stands for a thing. It's not an expletive, but in this, ca in the case I gave you, it is. Yes. Why, why do you even need the expletive? Why couldn't you just, if we became used to using it, just say, "Are three dogs on the corner?" Well, you, uh, in a different language, you might. English happens to have this device to get you started in certain cases. It's it's a way of of slowing up the opening of a sentence instead of coming out baldly and saying, three dogs are on the corner." It's a way of letting you get into it a little more slowly if you want to emphasize it. There are three dogs on the corner. And there are keys the reader. Something is coming, you see. It's a little crutch, which is helpful sometimes when you want to stress or emphasize. This is a small stylistic point. All right, you now are experts in subject and predicate in a preliminary way. And that together expresses a complete thought, which is a sentence. Now there are two other types of word groups which we must distinguish from a sentence. They are not sentences. And those are, who knows the two types? Phrase, Phrase and clause. clause. Phrase and clause. C-L-A-U-S-E, of course. Now let's take a phrase first. Let me give you the definition of phrase. Now these are exact words. You know, this is not a loose usage, and we're gonna we're gonna need this for parsing. Phrase. A group of related words which functions as a single element in a sentence, but does not have a subject and predicate. A group of related words, two or more, it has to be at least two which functions as a single element in a sentence, but which does not have a subject and predicate. A phrase is a fragment of a sentence. It has its own unity as an element, but it doesn't have a subject predicate structure, so it's not a complete thought. Look at now item two on the same page. The cow jumped over the moon. Now consider just the words over the moon. Over the moon there functions as a single unit, it tells you in, in essence what? Where the cow jumped, right? You could have said the cow jumped up, but instead you said the cow jumped over the moon. So it functions as a unit. Together, the three words become like one entity. 
only it is three words. Is there a subject and predicate in over the moon? Obviously not. No verb, no entity doing anything. What is, uh, who knows what uh, is the name of this type of part of speech of which over is an example. Now we didn't cover this and we're not even covering it until next week. So if you don't know, I don't hold it against you. But for the heck of it, what would be a good name for a little word that comes before a big word and governs it? It takes the position before a big word, like a preposition, you see. <laughs> and then therefore governs moon, you see. Gives a spatial relation in this case. And what could you think of a good word for a little word that has that preposition? <laughs> yes, it's called a preposition, right. Now, you see you have a lot of talent as grammarians. If you had to name the type of phrase this was according to its structure, and you wanted to make a name for a phrase that began with a preposition, what do you think you would call it? Called a prepositional phrase. Very good. Okay. So over the moon is a prepositional phrase. Now I will define preposition for you next time, but basically it's a little word designating spatial or temporal relationships which govern some big word. We'll get to that next time. All right, now look at the next one. The cow was jumping up and down. Was jumping is a phrase. Why? It's two words which functions as a single unit. Why does it function as a single unit? Uh, I'd like to get some different people. How about on the gray couch over there? Yes, I caught your eye first, unluckily for you. Uh, why does this function as a single unit, was jumping? Right, it gives the action. It happens to be two words. You could just as well, for instance, have said jumped, which would be one word, right? Now, what would be a good name for this type of phrase? This is not a prepositional phrase. This is a phrase which takes the, which is a verb, right? So guess what you'd call that? Make it up. A verb phrase or a verbal phrase. Very good. All right. Now, continuing this same, uh, what, what other phrase do you see just in the heck of it in this sentence? The cow was jumping up and down. Up and down is a phrase. Um, you could even, if you wanted, say the cow is a phrase because it's two words which functions as a single unit, the subject. Now, what about though, this is what I want to stress, the two words up and, is that a phrase? No. You can't take any two words and say this is a phrase. It has to form a logical unit. And up and does not. On the other hand, it can be many more than two words. Take the next example. Jumping up and down like a maniac, the cow had a heart attack. Now who, now who can give me the first phrase, what can be regarded as a phrase in that whole sentence? Well, give me the longest thing that can qualify as a phrase. Keep going. Jumping up and down like a maniac. The whole thing does what? Tells you something about the cow, right? The whole thing functions as a unit to characterize the cow. So you could regard the whole thing as one phrase. And then, of course, you could break it up into subphrases. Like a maniac is what type of phrase? Like? Like over, it's a prepositional phrase, right? Who knows, just out of curiosity, although here again you don't have to know this, what is the type of word jumping represents? Does anybody know? From grade school or whichever? That's a par participle, right. I'll explain that brief shortly. So what would you call a phrase introduced by a participle? Participial phrase. We'll get to that. All right. So much by way of an introduction to phrases. Now let's introduce clauses by contrast. Now one thing you're going to want to do, you see, when you analyze sentences is bracket all the phrases. And that'll help bring this chaos down into a unity because each of those units will function like one word, you see. So you'll be able to easily take a whole section and say, oh, that's just a prepositional phrase and get rid of that. That's just a, a, you know, a participial or whatever. All right, now cl the clause. Let's turn to clause. 
A clause is a group of words or a group of related words that does have a subject and a predicate. So it's much closer to a sentence. But it is still not a complete thought. It is not self-intelligible. It doesn't stand by itself. Remember, that's the definition of a complete thought. A clause. It's very important that you get this. A group of related words that does have a subject and a predicate. But it is still not a complete thought. It's not self-intelligible. It doesn't stand by itself. Now look at number three. When I left for Paris... What is the subject of that? Now I want the entity you're talking about. I. Jim. I is the subject, right. What is the predicate? What do I say about I? Left for Paris is the predicate. So I've got I left for Paris. And if I simply said I left for Paris, that would be a complete thought. That would be a sentence. But with the word when, the when indicates what? I'm not simply stating that something happened. I'm saying when something else happened. But I don't tell you that something else. So this is not self-contained. This is therefore exactly the definition of a clause. It has a subject and a predicate, but it doesn't stand by itself. It points to a larger whole beyond itself. And therefore, notice I put a small w there. That's how virtuous I was in typing the when because it is not a sentence so it doesn't get a capital W. I, I'm not sure I followed this policy consistently but at least there I was aware of it. And I didn't put a period either. I put two slashes because a period is the dignity only of a sentence and this is a, only a clause. Now after it you see another uh, clause. What he said was the subject he was the predicate said. said and what is what well you'll see that's a little word that introduces it and sticks it on to the rest for instance she knows what he said then what he said fits into she knows and makes a full sentence but by itself it's a little unit with a subject and a predicate and like a hook coming out saying, I need something else, this is not a complete thought. That's a clause. Uh, somebody had a question. Yes? In this case, is it not also the object of the verb? Oh, sure. She knows, it's sure. she knows what he said. It's the object of knows. Sure. We're going to get to that. Clauses function as subject or object or adverbs. Just give me time. I guarantee to get there. Yes? These could also be complete sentences if they were answering the question that were the subject understood, correct? Like what? Well, if someone asked a question and someone answered, when I left for Paris. Oh, then, then he's implying it happened when I left for Paris. That is by implication but a it, part of a, the rest of the sentence. But the answer, when I left for Paris. No, Paris, it's not a full mean? sentence. No, it's not a full sentence no matter what. The most you can say is, in some context, it implies other words which make it a full sentence. But by itself, this is not a full sentence no matter what context it is. Now, um, we're going to be getting many types of clauses, I do guarantee. Yes? I want to ask you, by this definition, an independent clause is not considered a clause. You're getting ahead of me again, but in a word, an independent clause, an independent clause is only so called when it's conjoined with a subordinate clause. And in that context, it does not stand by itself. A plain ordinary sentence, I left for Paris, would not be called an independent clause. It's just a sentence. So in that sense, technically, even an independent clause doesn't stand by itself. That's a good question, but I'm afraid it lost the class, but maybe not. Now, to sum up, phrases and clauses are parts of sentences, but not themselves sentences. They don't stand alone as complete thoughts. Now, just before we take our break, let's do a quick exercise to... Um, Turn to the homework for this uh, lecture. 
And let's just do a few to consolidate this and then we'll take a break. Uh, how many clauses in number one? Just raise your hand if you know. Now remember, whenever there's a subject and a predicate, you have a clause. So take sentence number one. How many clauses? Raise your hand when you know the answer. The answer simply has to be given as a number. One, two, three, four, whatever. Kathy. Two, correct. Do you want to tell us what the two clauses are? One. And? Two, right. What's the subject of the first clause? What's the predicate? What's the subject of the second clause? What's the predicate? Okay, and when is just, we're waiting, we haven't yet come to when. Who knows for the heck of it what when would be called, what part of speech. When it's used, well, I'll see if you can figure out this word. <laughs> this word when has actually got two functions in this sentence, right? It's a time reference. It tells you that something happened at a certain time. It tells you when the beginning happened. So it helps to modify a verb. And what is the thing which helps to modify a verb called? But this is also an adverb which is used to help conjoin the first clause to the second. It sticks the first clause to the second. What would be a terrific name for an adverb used as a conjunction? It's called either a conjunctive adverb or an adverbial conjunction. You have your choice, right. That's just in case you are baffled by why we keep leaving when out. Now, wait a minute. We're just doing a little exercise here. Look at number four. How many clauses in number four? Unfortunately, I can't see to the back, and so you have the advantage by looking down and never raising your hand. Is there someone seated on the floor at the back there? Gloria, are you there? No. How many clauses in number four? Can't hear you. Well, you got one more than I did. Let's see how you did it. Give me number one. Can't hear you. Only three. Okay, you're down to three. That's what I am too. Number one, learning may be easy. Learning is the subject. May be easy as the predicate. Number two, if you are learning from a good teacher, with if being one of those words like when, and the subject is you, predicate are learning from a good teacher. And number three, teaching is work. Teaching is subject, is work is predicate. And what is but? But is one of those pure words which only conjoins. It just sticks together other clauses. So if it's a pure, what? Conjunction. Conjunction. We'll get to that next week. All right. Um, for the heck of it, just before we stop, find me a, a, a prepositional phrase in um, number one. Mr. Benander. Into the room. Into the room. Uh, can you find me a, um, a uh, verbal phrase in number four? Howard. Teaching is work. No, no. A ver a, meaning a phrase which makes up a verb. Teaching is the subject. It's not a verb there at all. I want two words at least which together make up a verb. Lewis. Our learning. Our learning, correct. Um, can you tell me the subject of the second sentence? Yes. Jack? Okay, Jack in essence is correct. What do you do with coming into the room? That really functions there as a modifier of Jack. So it's like Big Jack began to remove his coat. So the whole subject technically is Jack coming into the room. But we'll get to there later. All right, now I want to turn to the topic of parts of speech.
There are eight parts of speech. I'll only be taking the key ones now, and we'll dribble in others next week. Uh, this relates to what we said before the break because we're going to be discussing the basic anatomy of the subject predicate structure. What is the essence of a subject predicate structure? And leaving aside complications, of which there are many, but leaving that aside, you can reduce the question, the answer to a simple statement. The subject is a noun, the predicate is a verb. If you strip away all complexities, all sentences, no matter how enormously complex, ultimately come down to birds fly, honesty pays, governments coerce, etc. A, a few loaded examples to live with. <laughs> the subject is a noun, the predicate is a verb. Not always, but in essence. So we have to therefore know what is a noun and a verb. Let's look at a noun. A noun is the part of speech that designates a person, place, thing, state, or quality. Or anything else. In other words, it's the name of a thing in a very, very broad and generous sense of the word thing. So obviously, chair and table are nouns. They stand for, ob for objects. Redness, the word redness is a noun. It stands for a certain quality. Now get this. The word running, R-U-N-N-I-N-G, is a noun. It stands for a certain kind of activity, running. Running is exciting. Love is a noun. It stands for a certain state. Space is a noun. It stands for a type of relationship. So you have to grasp that we're talking about thing in a very, very broad sense. But understanding that, we can say that nouns are essential to language. They're the only primary means of referring to an aspect of reality. The only pri this is not a definition, but this is a fact about nouns. It's the only primary means of referring to an aspect of reality, of singling something out for reference, discussion, thought, communication. To do that, in essence, to pick something out of reality and focus on it, requires a noun in essence. And therefore, the essence of the subject, the subject is what you're thinking about, will be a noun. Now, I hasten to add, nouns will appear in many places other than the subject. For instance, Jack hit the ball. The ball is a noun, but it's not part of the subject, so don't assume that all nouns are in the subject, but the subject will in essence be nouns. To which I immediately add, except when it isn't. In other words, the subject may not actually contain a noun, but a substitute for a noun. And there are many substitutes for nouns, or many equivalents of nouns. Here's a, an obvious substitute for a noun. Instead of saying, Jack hit the ball, I say, he hit it. Now the subject there is he. And this is a little word occupying the place of the noun. It functions for the noun, pro the noun. See, so you would normally call that a pronoun. Pronoun is just a word that functions for a noun, a substitute, a replacement for the noun. And it, he hit it. It, the pronoun for the ball. That's a linguistic shorthand, and a pronoun, therefore, is not, doesn't represent anything new. It's considered a separate part of speech, but it simply is a shorthand way of referring to a noun, and therefore is always replaceable by a noun if necessary. Now, to give you a bit more insight, the subject of a sentence does not have to be even a noun or a pronoun. There are many equivalents, that is, combinations of words that function as nouns even though that's not blatantly and obviously what they are. Now let me give you um, a, a famous sentence as an example. 
To err is human. To forgive divine. What is the subject of is human? To err. Now, to err per se is not a noun or a pronoun. Who knows uh, what uh, that is called? To err. You must know this because it's got a good presence in the Reader's Digest all the time. Who knows uh, to err, what type of word uh, that's called? An infinitive, an infinitive. Right, I'll explain that several lectures from now. But it's a, it's a, it's a co combination of words which functions as a noun. It's a phrase which functions as a noun in this sentence. So if you were going to make up a name for it, you could call it a noun phrase, right? To err. It simply is a way of designating the process of making a mistake. Could have said erring is human or to err is human. The same meaning, but happen to be two words in this construction. What about this sentence? What he said upset me. What is the subject of that sentence? What he said, right? That's the same as though I had said his words upset me, which would have been a noun, words. But in this case, instead of saying a noun, I said three words together, which as a unit are the equivalent of his words. And that functions as the subject as a noun. That is what type of construction, what he said. That's a clause, right? That's a clause functioning as the subject. So it's a clause functioning as a noun. And therefore, what would you call it? Noun clause. Very good. Now, if you understand these complexities, you can say that the subject of a sentence is always a noun or a noun equivalent, including a noun equivalents, pronouns, phrases, and clauses which function as nouns. Now let's look at the predicate. The essence of the predicate is the verb. What is a verb? The part of speech which expresses the action or state of being of some subject. A verb is the part of speech which expresses the action or state of being of some subject. There's two things there, action and state of being. Let's take them in order. Action first. He ran. Ran is a verb. Jack hits. The cow will jump. The teacher had known. You see, the verb in English is often a phrase. It's one verb, but several words functioning as a unit. All of those indicate action. He ran, hit, jump, knew. Now, why do we stick in state of being and say the part which expresses the action or state of being? Because some verbs do not indicate any action on the part of the subject, but simply the condition of the subject, the state it's in. For instance, he is healthy. Is does not indicate any action he's doing. It's the verb, but it simply indicates the condition he is in. And that, of course, is the verb to be. And that would be the arch example of a verb which indicates state of being rather than action. And there are many others. For instance, it smells good. Now, it, for instance, the pie is not going around sniffing. You can't say, it is smelling good. It's simply there, but you're, it's a way of saying it is good, and you can detect it by your sense of smell. So it doesn't indicate the action of the subject, but just the state or condition. Or uh, it seems OK. Seems is like is. Or it tastes good. Tastes like smells. There's a collection of those verbs which do not indicate action, but merely state. And that's why we put that qualification in. <clears throat> Understanding this, the predicate of a sentence must always contain a verb. There's no escape, no proverbs, like there are pronouns. No verb equivalents, like there are noun equivalents. You have a verb or you got nothing. You can't get off the ground. Now, here comes the point tonight, which if you get you're all set 
And if you don't get, nothing further will penetrate. So draw some line. This is very, very essential distinction. It's, it's easy, but you must believe it. You must make an absolute distinction between verbs and words which are called verbals, V-E-R-B-A-L-S. Verbs versus a verbals. Now we have been talking about verbs. And a verb, again, remind you, means a specific indication of action or state which can unite with a subject to make a sentence. Runs, is running, did run, had run, will run, will be running. All of those are verbs. Take any subject and add it, and you have a sentence. He runs, he is running, he did run, etc. Right? Any word or collection of words which indicate action or state which you can combine with a subject to make a sentence, that's a verb. What then is a verbal? Well, for example, a word simply like running, just by itself, running. Not is running, was running, or will be running, but just plain, ordinary running. Now, you cannot combine that with a sentence with a subject to make a sentence. There's no such sentence as Bill running. You could say Bill is running, was running, but not just Bill running. So running is a word derived from a verb. That's why it's called a verbal. But it does not function by itself as a verb. It is not a verb. Now, there are three kinds of verbals. We're going to have a lot of time to discuss these later, slowly with their details and their uses, but for now you must become familiar, just so that you can know that these things are not verbs, but verbals. Now, if you look at number four, there's a simple example. Running is a lot of work. What is the verb in that sentence? Raise your hand when you know. The verb. B. Not the verb, but the verb. Yes. Is. It's correct. What is the subject? Running. Running. Running there is a noun then, right? Designating a certain activity. But it's a noun formed from a verb. We took the verb run and we made a noun out of it. Who knows the name for a verbal used as a noun? It's got a special name, and I can't explain this one, unfortunately. I mean, I can't make it self-evident. I'm sure I could if I knew its roots, but I don't. Who knows the name of a verbal used as a noun, as in this case of running? Starts with the G. Are you still with us? Gerund. G-E-R-U-N-D. A verbal used as a noun. That's number one on the head parade of verbals, which is not a verb. Now look at the next sentence on number four. Running quickly, he soon tired. What is the uh, verb in that sentence? The verb. I'd like to get someone at the very back there. Yes. Tired. What? Tired. tired, right. He tired. Excuse me, tired. He is the subject. Um, what then is running in that statement? It's not a verb, it's not the subject, it's not a noun. What does it actually function as? It describes something. What does it describe? The he, or the tired, or what? Describes he, right? Him, if I could change it. So therefore, what is the word called that describes a noun or pronoun? Adjective, very good, we're going to get to that. A verbal used as an adjective is called a participle. So running in the second sentence is a participle. Not a verb. It's an adjective. And then the last verbal, to run is sweet. We've already covered that to run is the third verbal, that's an infinitive, and in this case it functions as a noun, the subject of is. 
in, in infinitives you'll see can be just about anything. That's why they're called infinitive. They're not limited to virtually any part of speech. All right. If you are able to grasp this, you can put all verbals aside now. We'll have a special part of an evening devoted just to the intricacies of verbals, gerunds, and so on. For now, we want just simple verbs. And the, ba the basic thing is to be able to recognize them. Yes? Um, we have gerund as a verbal use of a noun, and it seems infinitive also is a verbal use of a noun. Yeah, but they have differences. Gerunds and infinitives are very similar to each other. They're the two closest verbals. It's not a strict definition. Uh, no, it's not a strict definition. I'll give you a strict definition. An infinitive can be used as other parts of speech as well, as you'll see. Whereas a gerund can only be used as a noun. Yes? Can a uh, participle be used as an adverb? As an adverb? Never. No. Participle is always an adjective. Always. That's by definition. You'll see when we get there. Uh, Verbal is simply a word derived from a verb which is not a verb. A word derived from a verb but which is not itself a verb. Yes? How would you define part of speech? Part of speech basically is simply the essential function uh, that a, a word can perform. It's always a word. Part it, a part of speech is always something a word does, but then there are groups of words which function as a unit. So a whole phrase or a whole clause will function as one part of speech, as we'll see. Now, I want to set verbals aside here. I want to just go back to noun and verb. I just mentioned them so you clear them out of the way for the moment. Understanding this, we can now understand what is usually called the simple subject and the simple predicate. Now, up to now, we've been talking as though the subject is the whole first half, in effect, and the predicate is the whole last half. And now we can be a little more precise. The single word which designates the subject, which is almost always a noun, is called the simple subject, and it's one word. The single word or words which indicate the action, which is the verb, is called the simple predicate. And hereafter, when we use subject and predicate, we're going to restrict ourselves to the simple subject and predicate. Now, for example, I'm going to give you a sentence, and you tell me the subject and predicate, understanding now and hereafter the simple subject and predicate, that is the bare fewest words which capture the essence of the subject, stripped of all details, and then of the action, stripped of all details. The fat cow jumps over the moon. What one word names the subject? Cow. cow. The rest just elaborates on that, but the essence is cow. That would be regarded as a simple subject. And what one word would be regarded as the simple predicate that simply gives the essence of the action? Jennifer. Jumps. Jumps, correct. Whereas over the moon becomes now merely a detail. Now look at uh, number five just as a brief exercise in picking out the simple subject and simple predicate, because from now on that's all I'm going to mean by subject and predicate. What is the subject of the first under number five? What is the subject? Ms. Buker. Governments. governments, that's all. The rest simply tells you types of government, how many, where are they, etc. But the core of it is governments. And of this whole rest of it, what is the essence of the predicate? What is the verb, in other words? Yes. Employ. So if you would strip that down to its essence, the sentence is government's employ. Right? All right, do the same with the next. What is the simple subject? Yes. I. I. Now I want the verb, and in this case it's not just one word. A verb, in this case, is a whole phrase. And you must give the whole verb for the predicate. Yes. Have been suffering. So the sentence here is, I have been suffering. Now we're going to, we'll do more of that, but you'll get the idea. Now what, are the, what do we call the rest of these, like most in the world, uh, sick with grief and all the rest of those words? 
the main other elements in a sentence beside the subject and predicate are modifiers, they're called. Modifiers, that's the general term. A modifier is a word which describes, limits, or qualifies another word. Describes, limits, qualifies another word. It's a word which describes, limits, or qualifies another word. In other words, it does not name a thing or indicate an action the way a noun or a verb does. It indicates the quality of something or action, in essence. And of course, there are two types of modifiers, which are adjectives and adverbs. Let's take them in order. An adjective is the part of speech that modifies a noun or pronoun. The good man, good, wise, large book, numerous students, this calculator, calculator is a noun, this is an adjective, why? It limits it, I don't say any calculator, I'm delimiting it to this one. Any word which functions in regard to a noun, to delimit it, bring it down, narrow it down, in some way qualified as an adjective. So if I say, um, I saw the man, what is an adjective in that sentence? The is an adjective, believe it or not. It's a pretty bare adjective. The, all it tells you is, of all the men in the world, this is one I've referred to before. Um, if I say, I saw a man, give me an adjective in that sentence. A tells you there was one and I never saw him before. That's called an indefinite article, but that's irrelevant. What's relevant here now is any word like that which helps to do something to a noun to tie it down. However, is called an adjective. And now, of course, if you want to be fancy of nomenclature, you can say there's all kinds of different types of adjectives. For instance, an adjective used to demonstrate, such as this calculator. What would be a good name for that type of adjective? To demonstrate, you see. It's a demonstrative adjective. But, I mean, there's no use because then you can have colorful adjectives, you know, etc. You don't need all those lesser subdivisions as long as you get the main idea. So adjective is straightforward. You can always tell an adjective by the fact that it qualifies a noun or pronoun. Now, an adverb basically qualifies everything else that can be qualified. An adverb does many more things than an adjective. There are four different things that an adverb modifies, or can modify. Obviously, primarily, an adverb modifies verbs. Any word that tells you how an action was performed, when, where, in what way, under what conditions, in what circumstances, is an adverb. He ran quickly, slowly, suddenly, etc. All those uh, uh, are adverbs. Woody, I think that sound is distracting some people here. Um, what is the mark of the adverb in the ones I just gave? Quickly, slowly, suddenly, rapidly, fiercely, violently, L-Y is the adverbial inflection in English. See that? We put together two words. <laughs> Except, of course, there are many words which are adverbs which do not end in L-Y, like now. Why does now an adverb? When it happened. Um, um, also, uh, there are words that end in L-Y that are not adverbs, so it's not always an infallible test. For instance, he was a manly man. Manly is an adjective telling what kind of man. It's not like rapidly. He didn't run manly, you see, so you can't always go by L-Y. But understanding this, this is a simple function of an adverb. Next. It turns out that the same words which modify verbs are also able to modify adjectives. 
Therefore, adverbs also modify adjectives. Thus, he was fairly bright. Bright is an adjective and fairly tells you to what extent was he bright. It modifies the adjective. By definition, a word that modifies an adjective is an adverb. I'll give you a sentence and you give me an adverb modifying an adjective in it. He was quite healthy. He was very poor. Very. Okay. Now, it turns out that the same words that modify verbs and adjectives can also modify other adverbs. He came very quickly. Quickly is the adverb, and very tells how quickly, so it modifies quickly, and a word modifying an adverb is an adverb. You did really well. Well tells how you did, that's an adverb. And really tells how well you did, so it modifies an adverb, so really is the adverb. Now you may wonder what is left. What is the fourth function of an adverb? And the answer is this. An adverb may also modify a sentence as a whole, or a clause as a whole. Not just one word like a verb, etc., but a whole group of words. It may function as a sentence modifier or a clause modifier. And it turns out that adverbs, the same words, do that too. Now, if you look at number six, I wanted to call that to your attention because this will baffle you otherwise in parsing. Honestly, she is nearly always sloppy. Now, the honestly there doesn't modify the is or the uh, sloppy. It, it amounts to being a sentence modifier. The honestly says, everything else that follows is true. Take my word for it. I'm not kidding. And notice it ends in L-Y, which is the adverbial ending. So honestly, there is an adverb modifying the sentence as a whole. Now, look at the next one. See if you can find a word. There's only five, so you have one chance in five there. Which is an adverb functioning as the modifier of a whole clause. He cheated, so he failed. Now you got one choice and five. He is a pronoun, so that blatantly can't be it. <laughs> Cheated and failed are both verbs, so there's nothing left that could possibly be an adverb in this, but so. And so in this case is an adverb modifying a whole clause he failed. What's the logic behind this theory? Why? It's telling you in effect. This whole next thought, he failed, is to be regarded as a consequence of the proceeding. The so is therefore a modifier of the whole clause, he failed. See, it's not just he or failed, it's he failed, which is the result. And again, therefore, that is an adverb. Now, this is very important because when we get to conjunctions, many adverbs, because of their ability to modify entire clauses, function as adverbs, uh, excuse me, as conjunctions as well. And uh, if you understand this, That'll be intelligible to you when we get there. All right, you know now the basic parts of speech. Noun, pronoun, verb, adjective, adverb. And then, of course, there's little ones that we threw in preposition, conjunction. I've thrown those around. And I'm not going to bother with interjection. That is, aha, you know, words of that sort, but they're not too crucial. What you now have to see with regard to parts of speech is that a part of speech is determined by the word's use in a sentence. You cannot, I'll repeat this, you cannot take a word and say, what part of speech is this? It entirely depends what use it has in the sentence. Now, look at number seven. Home. Now let's take home in each of these uses and you tell me what part of speech it is. Number seven. My home is yours. Raise your hand if you know what part of speech home is. Yes. Who's that? Jennifer? No. Yes. 
Against the corner, yeah. Say? I want the part of speech. Subject is the function of a sentence. Part of speech, your only choice is noun, pronoun, verb, adjective, adverb. Noun, correct. All right, home in on the enemy plan. What part of speech? Verb. Verb. The home team lost the game. Adjective tells you the what kind of team. I went home for dinner. Where I went describes the action. It is a, an adverb, right. All right, another exercise right after on round. This is just to get you to see that you, these words can all, many of them can have many different parts of speech assigned to them depending on their function. We lost the round. Name, you know, if you know right away, what part of speech is round? Jim, noun. I should have had the brains to rearrange these. Oh, here, she went round the bend. Now that's one we didn't officially cover. That's around is one of those little words that indicate a relationship and govern a noun. That's a preposition round. He went round and round. The two rounds there. Where he went, adverb. We round the corner at noon, verb. His shoulders were round, adjective. OK, you got it. All right. Yes? Would it be accurate to say that modifiers that modify nouns are adjectives? And all other modifiers are adverbs? No, because there's modifiers that modify pronouns. Nouns or pronouns are adjectives. Everything else is adverbs. My point is that's a special case of modifiers. Of, no, of noun, yes, that's correct. Basically, the all-purpose modifier is an adverb. And the specific for a noun is an adjective. That's correct. Well, you can see it's four to one, in effect. So the chances are you're going to find an adverb over an adjective. Yes? Is, is it if a, a noun has to be the subject? Can you have a noun that is not the subject? Sure. Absolutely. I don't understand why I went home, why home is not a noun. Because it tells you where you went. It functions as the direction. I went, I could just as well have said, to my home. In which case, home there would have been a noun governed by the preposition. But by itself here, it simply functions like a home word. It has that same function of indicating the direction of the action. So it modifies. If you wanted to make it a noun, you'd have to say, I went to my home, you see. Then you would have a prepositional phrase. To, my is the adjective and home is the noun. But in this construction, there's no reason to, you see, what may be bothering you is this. Originally, it was a noun. We said, I went to my home. But after a while, I realized that to my was unnecessary. You could just say, I went home. And now it has the function of simply modifying where you're going, modifying the going, without itself singling out a special entity, you see. I mean, it does by the nature of the meaning. But by the grammatical form of it, it functions simply now as an adverb rather than as a noun. Originally, it was a noun. So it's a shorthand noun functioning as an adverb. You'll find that throughout grammar, that things that were originally begun to take on another uh, uh, um, syntactical form. Yes? Another way of saying it is that really shorthand for an adverbial phrase? Yes. That, 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 that yes, you, that. absolutely. That's another way of saying that. You could say it's shorthand for an adverbial phrase, but it's a shorthand in which, you know, it just we can barely reconstruct it now, and a hundred years from now, they probably won't even be able to reconstruct it. It'll just seem completely natural. Like, I went up, I went round, I went home, you see. Now, I if we grasp this, we'll see that, going back to the parts of speech and the sentence structure, the typical sentence will consist of a noun with various modifiers, just adjective of some kind, and a verb in various modifiers, right? And that's what will give you the sentence. Look at number eight. The tall boys read easily and quickly. The simple subject there is boys. That's the noun. What are the adjectives modifying boys? Two adjectives, the and tall. What, are, what is the verb? Read. What are the modifiers? How many modifiers? 
Which two words? Easily, quickly. Two adverbs. What do you do with and? That's one of those little words joining other words. In this case, conjoining two adverbs. So it is a conjunction. We're going to get to that next time. Or look at the next one. Many men are too studious. Noun. Man. What's many? Adjective. Modifying men. Verb. Are. Adjective in the predicate describing men. Studious. What part of speech is to? Raise your hand if you know. Jennifer. Very good. It's an adverb. Why is it an adverb? Because it modifies an adjective. Right. Tells you how studious. All right. Well, is this all that's involved in a sentence? Just the subject and the verb with their modifiers? No. We need to throw in one other ingredient. You'll be happy to know it's the last ingredient. Because look, I could say, John is taking, and quit speaking. And your immediate thought, you'd be you know, enormously frustrated to say, John is taking what, right? Something has to be there at the end to take the action of taking, to receive it, to complete the sentence. Or I could walk in and say, my brother seems, and sit down. I have Sub subject, brother, and a verb seems, but it's obviously incomplete, right? Or, I met. What obvious question? Who? Whom? Right? We haven't come to that yet. So, in many cases, the sentence to be completed needs a completer. No, no. Something that will complete it. Now, what would you call the part which completes it? So that after it, there's nothing more to complement. It's completed. Get it? It's called a complement. And the complement is P-L-E, obviously. P-L-I means when you say something nice about somebody. But this is P-L-E. Complement means completer. The words used to complete the construction after the verb to finish the essential thought. Now, not every sentence has a complement. It is not an essential the way subject and predicate is. For instance, the sun rose is a perfectly good sentence with no complement. Or birds fly. Finished. That's OK. But many, many require a complement. And number nine gives you some of the main examples. John hit. The ball. Complement here is the ball. Completes the sentence. It's a noun with the adjective the. Now, if you can stand it, what is a complement called when it comes after a verb designating action rather than state? It's the object, right. That's all. Object is a subtype of complement. It's the complement when the verb indicates action. John hit. What did he hit? What received that action? The ball. So ball is the object. Excuse me. What did you say that was again? The object? The object is the complement after a verb of action. John hit it. What is the object. It. He likes running. What is the object? Running. He wants to go. What is the object? To go. Now, he is happy. Here's the one case where object is not applicable, because this is a verb of state. There's no action to be transferred. And consequently, happy there is a pure complement. It can't be called an object. And it is uh, an adjective in this case. Lights and are regarded as processes, psychological processes which take objects. Yes. The only things that don't take objects are verbs which designate state that I gave, like is, seems, tastes, smells. The ones I exemplified, there's only six or eight of them. You meant to say adverb. What did I mean to say adverb? He is happy. Happy is not an adverb. 
Happy describes him. He tells. You couldn't use it in that sense. Happy is. No, no. Is is not a state that you can be happily or not otherwise. It just you are. This is simply a, a describing an attribute of him. He, the person, is enjoying himself, and is simply gets him into existence. So you can't modify the verb to be. The verb to be is what's called a copula. It links together, in this case, a pronoun and an adjective. Yes? Um, I'm not sure I understand why complement has a separate uh, form for it. After modifiers and predicates and all that. Well, because it's what's left. If, we, if predicate is verb, basically, and that's what I now refer to as, subject and verb is not enough. In many sentences, you need something to complete the construction. Otherwise, you would just have such as I gave, for instance, my brother seems. You wouldn't have a full sentence. We want the structure of a full sentence. And many sentences require a complement to complete the essential grammar. So would you say complement is usually made up of adverbs and adjectives? Well, uh, there's many possibilities. It could be a noun. Look at these examples. A noun, a pronoun, a gerund, an infinitive, an adjective. It can be anything. It's all the parts. It's any and all parts which function in that context to complete the grammar. And now, if the verb indicates action, then the complement is called the object. Lewis. So the, the complement is not considered part of the subject or predicate? No, no. Not in the, in the narrow sense that subject is the noun or pronoun and predicate is the verb. Then complement is, is not part of either. It's only part of the predicate if you divide the whole sentence into subject or predicate. So you do consider it part of the complete predicate? Part of the total predicate, yes. Okay, now we've got, therefore, the basic structure of a sentence is going to be noun as subject, verb, and then, in effect, object, with a whole bunch of modifiers strung around. That's the basic English syntax. Noun, verb, object, or complement. And then all kinds of modifiers. That's what you'll most often find. Maybe the noun will have a pronoun, Maybe the verb will be a long phrase. Maybe the complement will be complex. But in essence, it'll come down to those three parts. John hit the ball. So you'll say, John, noun, subject. Hit, verb, predicate. Ball, noun, object, the, adjective, modifying that noun. That's a simple example. But, yes? Is it also the basic syntax of any language? No. I, I don't know enough about any language to say so. But I don't, uh, I guess in some way it might, it might be, but in what form I wouldn't want to commit myself. Now I want to do one last but important point. We've been talking about parts of speech, and we have talked about phrases and clauses. Now I want to bring those two topics together. both phrases and clauses. Remember we said each of those functions as a unit. Well, that means as a single part of speech in a sentence. A phrase, a whole phrase, can be used as an adjective, or an adverb, or a noun. A clause can be used as an adjective, an adverb, a noun. So what we have to do now is see in what way the different parts of speech are applicable, not simply to single words, but to combinations which function as units. You got that? You got that? Now let's look at number 10. The man from Denver. From Denver is a phrase, a prepositional phrase. That phrase as a whole functions as what part of speech in relation to man? An adjective tells you which kind of man. So from Denver would be called an adjective prepositional phrase. All right, from the next example in number 10, give me another adjective phrase. I know you're getting tired, but it's not long before the agony stops. And then you'll have some, all of the basic vocabulary if you can last out this last bit. Arlene. Of green vegetables is a phrase 
prepositional phrase and functions as an adjective describing crates. One more prepositional phrase functioning as an adjective in number 10. For cutting meat, right, what kind of knife? You got that? That's very simple, right? So it's three words, but they function as one adjective, even though one is a preposition. Now, what type, part of, what type of word is cutting, by the way? Does anybody know? It's derived from a verb, and it's used as a noun for the process of cutting. It's a gerund. There's a gerund within a prepositional phrase functioning altogether as an adjective modifying knife, see? <laughs> see, you could really make an impressive statement when you know all this. <laughs> now, number 11 gives you examples of adverb phrases. That is, phrases used as adverbs, and again, prepositional phrases. Uh, give me the first one in number 11. Into the water, where you dive. Next, raise your hand if you see an adverbial phrase. Lewis. By six, By six feet. How he missed the wall. So it describes the action of missing. Now I'd like to see if you can find an adverbial phrase in the next one. Now that's a little less obvious. But nevertheless, very logical. Who can find an adverbial prepositional phrase in the next sentence? Uh, Miss Office, yes. In a million years, very good. Why is that an adverb? What does it modify? When? Well, no, no. You have to tell me what it modifies. Admit. No, it doesn't admit. Never. Doesn't say he will admit in a million years. Never. never in a million years. In other words, it tells you what kind of never you're talking about. This is not never next week. It's never in a million years, right? What part of speech is never? It's an adverb. What do you call a modifier modifying an adverb? An adverb. In a million years modifies never. So this is a phrase modifying an adverb, so it's an adverbial phrase. Got it? Lewis. Why wouldn't you call the whole thing never in a million years? Well, because you're trying to break it down. You would. The whole thing is one sentence, but the idea is to break it down. Yes, it's a complex phrase. Never in a million years is the whole thing is an adverbial phrase. But now in a million years within that uh, modifies never. Now what is an adverbial phrase in the next sentence? It was too close for comfort. Too is an adverb, but that's not a phrase, so that doesn't count. Not much left here. <laughs> uh, Ms. Buker, yes. For comfort, why is that an adverb? It says how close. Very good. And what part of speech is close? Adverb. No. It was close. Oh, adjective. Adjective. And what do you call a phrase that modifies, I mean a modifier that modifies an adjective? An adverb, right? So for comfort is an adverbial phrase because it modifies an adverb. Yes. An adjective. Yes. Isn't this like a preceding example that modifies two? Explain why to? No, it modifies close. Tells you close how. Close what? To see for what? No, for comfort. So it tells you it, it, it delimits the type of closeness you're talking about. Now you have to be able to get that. It doesn't say um, it, it, was, why it was too much. It, it, it helps to explain why it's too much. That's true. But directly speaking, it tells you what type of closeness do you have in mind. Too close for sex, too close for microscopic inspection, too close to get an overview, too close to be comfortable, or what? You see. So in that sense, it delimits closeness. That would be how it's technically described. I don't think it really makes a huge difference if you want to say it explicates too, but uh, this would be technically how it's said. Is the whole thing too close for comfort and adjective? Or too close for comfort, if you take the whole thing as one unit, is an adjective, right. But it's an adjective made up of an adjective with an adverb in front and an, and an adverbial phrase at the end. 
That's okay, you'll get good at this. Number 12 now. Now so far we've just done prepositional phrases. Now here are phrases which again function as different parts of speech, but they are not prepositional phrases, just to broaden your understanding. Look at number 12. Darting up the wall, the mouse escaped. Well, I've given the answer there. The phrase is darting up the wall. Why is that a phrase? There's no subject and predicate, right? Why is that a participial phrase? It starts with a participle. Why is that an adjective? What does it modify? Mouse. So there's a phrase, not a prepositional, but a participial used as an adjective. Next. The knocking at the gate was irksome. What? No, no. You have to get this straight when we discuss participles is when it will finally get in to your mind. But you must, at this point, try to grasp participles modify only nouns or pronouns. They are verbals which modify nouns or pronouns. And this does not say that the escape was darting up the wall. It says the mouse was darting up the wall. But strictly, it doesn't say the mouse was. It says the mouse escaped. Which mouse? Wait, the one darting up the wall. So it delimits mouse, you see. Anything that delimits a noun is an adjective. That's by definition. It's like John coming into the room. That's right. It's the same as John coming into the room. Now, you must go by the form of the words. You can't think to yourself, well, but it really tells you how he escaped because he escaped by jump darting up the, up the wall. The, the form of the words requires you to interpret it this way. If you wanted to get that, you know, what you're saying out of it grammatically, you'd have to say, the mouse escaped and did so by darting up the wall. In which case, by darting up the wall would be a prepositional phrase modifying the doing, you see. But in this... The mouse escaped darting up the wall. It doesn't make any difference. Same thing. Same thing. The escaping, you see, an adverb has to modify, tell you how an action is performed. Like, he escaped quickly, he escaped uh, suddenly, he escaped yesterday. But if it's, if, if it's, you see, if it's darting up the wall, then it's something about a mouse that delimits the mouse. And therefore, uh, you have to regard that as an adjective. You'll, you'll get it clearer, I think, when we take more examples. Yeah. Could you make a distinction by saying, um, the, if you said the mouse escaped by darting up the wall, versus... Then it's a different thing. That's a different grammar if you said by darting up the wall, because then by darting up the wall is a prepositional phrase, which tells you how the escape was accomplished. So it would be an adverbial prepositional phrase. But in this case, going strictly by what is stated, not by your inner sense of the meaning, it's the mouse, which mouse? The mouse darting up the wall escaped. So it functions as an adjective. Now look at, I'd like to give a few more examples here. Look at the next one. The knocking at the gate was irksome. The phrase here is the knocking at the gate. That's the subject. And it functions as a noun, the whole thing. Now, of course, the actual noun, the key noun in that is knocking, which is the gerund. At the gate is a prepositional phrase modifying knocking, and the is an adjective. But the whole thing together functions as a gerund phrase, subject, of, was. She put a pie into the oven to bake. Now, to bake there is an infinitive. Remember I told you infinitive is so-called because it's not limited to any use. It's infinite in its uses, more or less. And particularly, you can use an infinitive as an adverb, an adjective, or a noun. And here's three examples. She put a pie into the oven to bake. To bake is a phrase, an infinitive. And how does it describe, what action does it describe? It's the purpose of the action. Now, I know that sticks in your throat, that the purpose is an adverb, and the mechanism is an adjective, but it happens in that mouse example. But if you bear with me, you will, in time, come to be able to take that with only one glass of wine. Um, he is a man to reckon with. What kind of man? 
to reckon with. So to reckon with is an infinitive functioning as an adjective. To heckle a speaker, that's an infinitive phrase functioning as the subject. That's an infinitive to heckle as a noun. What is the object of to heckle? The object, a speaker, right. So you have a noun which is the object of your infinitive and then the total phrase is the subject of its, right? You get the idea, in other words, that phrases function as parts of speech and you can apportion them as noun, adjective, adverb. Now the last thing we have to see is that the same is true of clauses. That is actually the last thought I want to load you with tonight. Clauses also function as parts of speech. They can be adjectives, adverbs, or nouns. Ignore the underscoring for a minute and look at 13. I need a hat that is light but warm. Take the clause, that is light but warm. Now that is a clause, right? It doesn't stand by itself, but it has a subject and a predicate, right? That is, and then light but warm is the complement within it. So we have a subject and a predicate, it is a clause. But the whole clause that is light but warm has what function? To modify what word? Hat, right? And therefore that is light but warm would be called an adjective clause. It's like a way of saying I need a light warm hat. You see, only we're giving a whole construction to our adjective. But it's still basically simply an adjective. That's an adjective clause. Now, for the heck of it, look at the word that in this sentence. I need a hat that. Here is a that, which stands for a hat, right? So it's a word standing for a noun. And relating that noun to the rest of the clause. What, what do we call a word that stands for a noun? A pronoun. What would you call a pronoun that relates a clause back to an earlier noun that relates a clause back to an earlier noun. A relative pronoun, that's what that is. We'll discuss that next week. All right, after he reflected on the matter, he apologized. What is the clause here that I have in mind? After he reflected on the matter, what does that tell you? when a certain action was performed, when the apology took place, it modifies the apologizing, it is therefore an adverb, adverbial clause. The whole business after he reflected on the matter is like an adverb. Although in itself it has a subject, he and a predicate reflected and so on. All right, what he will decide is important. Now, what part of speech is what he will decide? That has a subject, he, a predicate, will decide. But the whole business together functions as the subject of is, right? So what is that actually functioning as? It's like his decision is important, but we express it in this clause instead of as a noun. But it's functioning as a noun. So it's a noun clause. What he will decide is a noun clause. And in this case, it's the subject. Now in the next sentence, she knows what he will decide. What he will decide is equally a noun, only it is now the object rather than the subject. Now the last thing I want you to know in number 13 is that in each of these cases, where there is a clause functioning as an adjective or an adverb or a noun, there is also a clause which is pure and simple the essence of the sentence, which is not simply an adjective, an adverb, or a noun, but is the essence of the thought. And that is called the main clause. And that is what I have underscored. I need a hat. That's the essence of the thought. It stands by itself as a complete sentence, right? I could just walk in and say, I need a hat. And then that is light, but warm is just like an adjective thrown on to that. Or, he apologized. That's the essence. And then, 
after he reflected just tells you when it happened. It's like an adverb. So he apologizes the main clause. Now in the next one, what he will decide is important, is important by itself, is not the main clause, because it doesn't have a subject. The clause has to have a subject and a predicate. Actually, you'd have to analyze the what as being that which he will decide. And then which he will decide is the clause, and that is important, is the main clause. And she knows in the last is the main clause, and then the other is just the object, what she knows. Now, we're going to be discussing main and subordinate clauses next time, but just to prepare you for it. In essence, whenever you have more than one clause in a sentence, one of them will be the heart of the sentence, and the rest will be like a single noun, an adjective, an adverb. The one that's the heart of the sentence is the main clause. And the essence of good writing in this regard is to get your main thought in your main clause. Now that is something we're going to discuss starting next time. But let me just conclude by giving you the homework. The homework is now on this sheet right after. And it says parse the following. Parse means basically, tell me everything there is to know about these seven sentences. <laughs> that is, I want to know the part of speech of each word, the subject and predicate of each clause, how many phrases, what kind of phrases, what they function as, what the clauses function as. In other words, everything we've said tonight applied to these seven sentences. Now, the first four are made up. Uh, five is from Lincoln, six is a summary of Kant, and seven is from Atlas. If you can do it on seven, you can do it on anything. You will see that I'm going to adopt the technique of taking up some new theory in exercises. So under three there, you'll see a section on appositives. Just ignore that. That's something I will explain when we get to. So basically, go over all of this. Also, find the main clause wherever there's more than one clause. Uh, now, underneath that, you'll see identify any errors in the use of modifiers. These are not errors that we discussed. But I, we did discuss modifiers. And these do have errors. So just to see what you can work out yourself, there are certain definite egregious types of errors committed in these three sentences. So figure out briefly, if you can, what the errors consist of. Uh, I may tell you that two and three is the same error and one is a different error. Uh, don't spend too much time. We will take all that up next time, and then we are going to go to the very crucial topic of subordination and coordination, which will occupy us next time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, if you have a crucial question, you can do it briefly, but it's after 10. Go ahead. Yes. I can't hear you. Those are not parts of speech. Those are words which function as parts of speech. A participle functions as an adjective. A gerund as a noun an infinitive as a noun, an adverb, or an adjective. They are not parts of speech. They are verbals, which can take different functions. Yes. Yeah. Are called verbals. That's not a part of speech. That just says where we got the words from. Okay? Part of speech is their function. Okay.